Champions League, who will win? 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 Champions League, Champions League, Champions League, Champions League, Champions League, who will win? Who these other teams you're kicking with? Huh, such a pity. 18 points, top the group. Yep, that's Man City. They kick them hard, they kick them long, they kick them back. City going back to back. Madrid will take a crack. Shout out to Rick Ross, the biggest boss, Ricky Rose, for that intro. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the Footy Fetish Show, sponsored by Total 90. Joining us, we've got a very dear friend and elite coach in the U.S., Safe. Welcome to the Footy Fetish Show. How are you? I'm great. How are you? Doing well. So as everybody knows, this is a footy fetish show where the fetish is real and the footy is soccer, where we like to talk about balls and feet. This episode, we'll be breaking down the round of 16 Champions League teams. But before we do that, Safe is a new guest on the show, so we got to ask him our three questions. First question, Coach Safe. What was your first memory of soccer, whether it was playing, watching, someone introduced it to you? What was your first memory? My first memory is probably probably playing in the youth leagues, uh, but I would say my first memory, because uh, I started playing when I was four, but my first memory of elite soccer uh, would be watching the 94 World Cup. That was the first first World Cup or first actual actually game that I've ever uh, watched was cool. uh, in the 94 World Cup. And I, I think the one that sticks out the most, I actually have some of those VHS recordings still was uh, uh, Brazil and Italy. Wow. Wow. Mm. So you like you have that memory in your brain. Oh, it's 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 there. I, I can hear I can hear the commentary when Roberto Baggio hits the the crossbar and oh. the penalty kick shootout and uh, oh, epic, yeah. <laughs> epic memory! Wow, that'll never you'll never forget that ever. It's a good one to have as your wow. as early days. Yeah. Wow! Wow! Okay, great, great, love that. All right, next question: Who's your club? Who's your team? Uh, Arsenal is the team that I support the most. Wow! Definitely, Another yeah. Been, been there, watched them played. Uh, I went. I went to my wife and I decided to go to to London in twenty twenty. I believe it was twenty seventeen. And I think the premise was we were going with a, a, a two dear friends that we have uh, that that we met um, at church, and they wanted to go to England. And I was like, you know, they wanted to go looking at castles and all this stuff. And I was like, you know, Sarah, we should go with them. <laughs> And, you know, I'd love to go see all those castles and whatnot. And, of course, in the back of my mind, I'm just thinking I'm going to, yeah, the Emirates. Yes, absolutely. I mean, you so, go yeah. to England, you got to at least go to the stadiums. Like, you don't have to see a game, but just go to the stadium. Like, those are... I did, and I got to go watch, actually, them play uh, Aston Villa. That was the year that Aston Villa got relegated, actually. I think Arsenal oh. won 5-1 five to five one or 5 nil. Oh, that's uh, got to be an amazing feeling. Five. It was a good time. Woo! You just walk out the stadium like the king, man. Five to one. Ooh. <laughs> That's amazing. All Always right. a good time. Last question, and then we'll get into it. Which player best represents your style of play? And it can be current, past, doesn't matter. Well, at the time that I was playing, uh, it would have been Susk Fabregas. Nice. Okay. Yep. Cool. H- had his boots and uh, played... I played holding mid in uh, in college, uh, toward the latter years of college, and then I played uh, in the in the NPSL uh, pro, and that was that was when NPSL was uh, NPSL still still quite big, uh, but it was it was a little bit bigger back then, and uh, I played in that holding midfield position and uh, was was similar in the ways of thinking about the game deeply and technique uh, and trying to plot my way around the pitch because I wasn't. 
I wasn't big enough and uh, athletic enough to, to, to do anything else. So just trying to survive that way. So I, a lot of the ways that he played and a lot of the ways that he plotted his way around the pitch were things that I, I tried to do. And that's the beauty of the sport of soccer is that you don't need to be a big athletic bruiser. You can have success as long as you can think and use your brain. Love to hear it, that. It is a it is a thinking it is a thinking man's game. That's right, uh, without a doubt. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. I didn't know you played in the NPSL. So can you kind of elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, I played with uh with the uh, Tampa Bay Marauders. Okay. And uh, yeah, it was a, a new a newly formed club at the time, and they oh, keep going. Yeah, they were uh they had some great players on that team. I was in the company of some unbelievable. Uh, unbelievable talents, very good players, uh, good guys, really good coach. Uh, our coach was the, uh, was the coach at he's he, well, he's still the, he's the associate head coach at university of Tampa, uh, coach Mo. And yeah, he was, a <laughs> uh, he was, he was a great coach, great guy. And yeah. Yeah, I ended up I ended up coaching the team eventually. <laughs> I was like, wait, is that your last name? <laughs> yeah, I ended up I ended oh, up taking over shit. after a couple of years. I think uh, I think Mo did it for for maybe two years, and then I took over and did it for a couple of years. And uh, so so yeah, I played in the the inaugural season, um, and then and then took over. I think uh, a year and a half later. Is this this is the coach you're talking about, Maurice? Yeah, Owen? yeah, very good coach. Uh, still the associate head coach at University of Tampa. Uh, really good guy, really good coach, and uh, just some tremendous people to be around. Alex Delgado as well was cool. he was an assistant coach, and uh, he's a tremendous person. Still very successful uh, over in the St. Pete area. So yeah, just a, a lot of a lot of good memories, a lot of good guys. Cool. Wow, that was a fun fact I didn't know about. I'm glad you could share that with us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Why are we here? It's for one reason only, and that's the Champions League. So really quickly, this is the group stage finalist, the first and second place out of the group stage. These are the draws. Safe, we're going to go one by one. We're going to see who you think will advance into the round of eight. Let's start with the top left, FC Porto and Arsenal. Um, you know, of course I'm going to take Arsenal. That's my team. Of but I... Yeah, of course, and but I, I mean, to be fair, I think that the, you know, the draws is, is is fine. Uh, when I watched the draw, I thought, you know, that's not a bad draw for Arsenal. Porto, very very good team, uh, very competent. I know that they're, I think they're maybe third or fourth in the league, uh, in Portugal. But uh, always a good team, always a really good Champions League team. There's always the Portuguese teams do really well, uh, in the Champions League. But I think you know, for Arsenal, I think that they will have looked at that and said. Uh, Mikel Arteta, I, I would imagine, would look at that and take that. Oh, absolutely. Of all the teams, that's probably one of the top two or three teams that you'd want to pull. Right. Not to discredit them, but I just feel like they don't play against the strongest opponents in their domestic league. So naturally, uh, a team like Arsenal, who's fighting every single weekend in the EPL, I feel like their their natural schedule is just going to naturally prepare them for a team that's kind of in a weaker league. So. I'm going to agree with you here. I think Arsenal do struggle a little bit at first, but I think that second tie, I think they walk away with this no problem. Let's move on over to a very difficult tie here. We've got Napoli versus Barcelona. Who you got and why? Oh, did I lose you? That's a really difficult one. No, I didn't. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I'm still here. Yeah, it broke, it broke up a little bit, but uh, I hear you. So, yeah, that, that that's a uh, that's a tough one. Um, I'd have to know a little bit more about the form of the teams, uh, in particular gonna, Napoli. I'm more familiar with Barcelona right now. I'm going to take a look at that really quick. Because I know Napoli, they've kind of fallen in Serie A. They, they lost their head coach from last year. So they've kind of had to restart, figure out their new identity. They still have a ton of ballers on that right. squad. But... Um, the the head coach and Victor Osimen, my internet is not cooperating right now, and that's okay. <laughs> that's all right. Well, and I think too that the, you know, the the Champions League for for what, you know, a lot of the stuff is mental, and I think that when you get in a position where you're, in a posi- in a time of transition where maybe the coach is, you know, there's a new coach, and uh, maybe there will be some some difficult 
again, transition to some difficult periods in that time, something like the Champions League can really bring you together uh, because it's, you know, essentially they're they're at the stage where it's the knockouts. It's a, it's a series of one-offs. So they're not having to, uh, it's a kind of, it's a different mental headspace when you're in a league format, uh, when you know you're going to be playing again next week uh, versus in the Champions League where you, when you don't know that you're going to be playing again. So I think that this would be like a, a nice, reprieve from the league where I see where they're seventh. I think this would be a nice uh, uh, respite for them to, to maybe refocus uh, on the Champions League, big stage, come out, show who they are, you know, put, you know, put some confidence uh, in them and belief in the locker room. And so I, you know, I, I think that the, I would say maybe part of the common sense of me would say Barcelona, but I think that the uh, the mental aspect, I would, I probably will give the edge to Napoli just to, because I believe that that's a very big part of the game is is uh, what we were describing earlier about their form and then getting a chance to show it in a different arena. Man, and that's it's funny you say that. That's spoken like a true head coach. And while <laughs> yeah. we're on this topic, why don't you why don't you tell the people uh, who you coach, where you coach? Uh, give us a little background on that. Yeah, sure. So I coach at Dalton State in uh, Northwest Georgia. Uh, it's an NAI program, a uh, very good program, been here for five years now, and uh, we've been ranked in the in the top five in the country, and uh, we've been, uh, this past year, we were number two in the country, the year before we were number one, uh, and uh, so we're we're always battling, always trying to, yeah, <laughs> we're working wow. on it, we got a, we, we got a great staff, uh, we got we got great, great human beings on the team, uh, so, so yeah, I mean, they've done a really good job, I've done five years there, and getting ready to do my, we're in the midst of recruiting, going to do my sixth year here in the, in August when it comes around and spent five years in Florida, uh, in, in Tampa, uh, at a small private Christian school, Florida college, uh, and had some success there and was able to, to get over to Dalton state and, and try and capitalize on that and build on that. So yeah, that's, that's what I'm doing. And, uh, yeah, it's been, it's been good 10 years, 10 years in and going to start my 11th year and, and excited to, to keep going. That's amazing. Glad to hear it safe. You deserve it. Can I ask, have you gotten the B license? Have you started to progress through those? I did just get the B license. Oh, uh, I just, yeah, I just got it like, uh, it was like two weeks ago, actually. Oh, congratulations, we, man. We just finished, man. Yeah, it was, oh, wow. uh, it was a grind. <laughs> it was really, was it that big of a jump? It was, it was, uh, you know, I, I'm pretty sure the biggest difference in terms of the grind part was the, I think it was the amount, um, I think there were more assignments and then there were more recorded assignments and ones that I wasn't expecting. So not only did we have to, to do some clips from our games and stuff, which I think was probably, you know, always going to happen. You, you have your, you record your training sessions, of course, and right. submit those. And I can see why we did some clips from some games. Uh, but one I was not expecting was clips from uh, the pre-match talk, uh, clips from the halftime talk and, uh, that was challenging because the games that I was coaching, uh, all, you know, everybody, all the games that people are coaching are important. So I'm, I'm not diminishing that at all. I'm just saying for me personally, uh, to be doing those, recording those videos against conference opponents. Uh, another one was in the national tournament. Um, I, you know, the last thing I really wanted to do was make sure that I was accomplishing an assignment for my B license uh, in, in recording those. So that was a bit of a challenge. And you know what, for the players, it's a little bit of an ex a distraction when there's a camera kind of in the corner of the locker room. So that, that was tough, but, but we survived. Wow. Wow. That's an experience. I never would have thought I, I would have imagined having a, a camera just sit there at halftime and just record everything. That's incredible. Wow. Yeah, it was, it, it was, def it was definitely different, but you know, you just kind of stick it in the corner and you do your thing. And at the end of the day, I wanted to win. Uh, the games I wanted for us to advance. I think that the uh, both games were really difficult, but obviously the national tournament one was like, you know, I mean, <laughs> you're like, you know, I, I don't want to be, <laughs> don't want this camera in here right now. I don't want to have to worry about whether I'm mic'd up right now. Uh, <laughs> not about what I was going to say or anything like that. Right. It wasn't really that. It was just no. more so, you know, I'm making sure that the camera's on and recording me. <laughs> I didn't really want to be thinking about that at the time. No, but it, yeah, you're losing your focus in the midst of uh, a moment where you need to channel all of your focus to the players. And 
I'm sure they saw that you were kind of distracted a little bit, making sure that the camera and can't imagine what that environment is like. So uh, I'll have to get there one day and, and tell you my experience. On, on what Good luck, happened. brother. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate that. Uh, going back to this, that was a great little side side tangent there. I'm glad we went there. I am such a big Serie A fan, and I love all of these players on Napoli that I am going to go with Napoli. Also, Barcelona are going through some financial troubles right now. There is a chance that they might not play next season. We'll have to see how they can manage their fa- finances, but I don't know if you heard, Safe. They just took a trip over to the U.S. to play Club America, and it was within 24 hours of playing a league game, and then they had to go right back to – Spain to to get back into the league and it was just like man that, I can't imagine the stress on the players playing a league game getting on a plane traveling to the U.S. playing there getting back on a plane and then being ready to suit up for another domestic league game I mean just like and it was it was only like a five million dollar payout like man was it really worth it yeah I, you know I it, it's uh you know you don't know what you don't know and uh <laughs> it seems like one of the more obvious statements, but but true nonetheless. Yeah. And I think that when you when you haven't been able to experience, uh, you know, there's there are some people that will have been able to to play at various levels and have to deal with you know travel and and things like that. But it's it's very difficult. It is very difficult to to win games on the road. That's probably one of the one one of the pieces of advice that I'll always remember from my mentor. Uh, even when we would go on the road and play a team that was maybe weaker and we might win, you know, maybe five, zero, six, zero. Uh, and he would say, you know, how's the game? And I'm like, ah, you know, it was pretty straightforward, you know, whatever. And he always used to tell me, uh, this was my first season coaching. He, he always used to say a, a, a road win is a good win. He always said that. And I, I didn't, I didn't quite understand it as well as I do now, but a road win is a good win because it's so difficult to go play on the road. And then you've got to return. Like you said, uh, you've got all kinds of dynamics, like your habits being out of order. You got your family that you're away from. Uh, you're in different places, eat, eating at different times. Uh, I mean, everything everything changes. And really, the picture that we get is the 90 minutes on the television. Mm. Uh, we don't get to see the rest of it. So, it's a uh, you know, I can imagine that it's uh, it's really difficult. If it's difficult for college players, it's it's you know, unimaginably difficult for these professionals. Definitely, that was great insight there. I never. I've never had to travel like that with a team. I mean, I go like an hour or two away to a nearby city for an overnight tournament. Mm-hmm. You're traveling with college 18 to 22 year olds trying to compete at the national level. Not even close. I can't even put myself in that frame of mind of having to have such a, a new schedule on the road, trying to win. And then, oh man, wow. Thank you. I mean, we should just keep sharing these. These are great. I've never, <laughs> I'm just like, I don't even think in that mindset right now, but you're, you're doing it. You're on your sixth year right now, getting ready to do that. So uh, appreciate all these little gems you're dropping here. Uh, <laughs> but that being said, let's keep going. Yeah. We'll, I'm let's sure we'll going. find some more here. So sure. I'm also going to go with Napoli just because of these troubles that Barcelona are having. But one of my favorite players is Victor Osimen. He's the center forward yes. for Napoli. He's crushing it. He'll be gone this mm-hmm. summer. Guaranteed, maybe even in January. Um, so I think he'll have a field day against that Barcelona back line. Let's move mm-hmm. on over to Paris and Real Sociedad. I think Paris takes this. They're just too strong. Uh, their, their depth, they have high-quality players. Real Sociedad could surprise them. Uh, they've, they've really shocked me in this tournament, just being able to make it to the round of 16. What are your thoughts on this tie? Yeah, I mean, you know, obviously PSG, <laughs> PSG, big time, you know, team. And I think that they will definitely win this game. And I mean, with the roster that they have, uh, you'd like to think that they'd make a, a pretty solid run uh, moving into the quarterfinals and beyond. But, you know, we'll we'll see kind of how that goes. But yeah, I expect them to, to win this game and and do pretty well. I'd like to see them. I'd like to see them make a little run here just because I like watching that team play yeah. uh, and I don't get to watch, I don't get to watch a lot of uh, the, the uh, French uh, league. So being able to watch, uh, you know, obviously done a room as a, you know, world-class goalkeeper, Hakimi, uh, Kylian Mbappe, you know, it's just anytime you get to watch him is unbelievable. Marquinhos. Right. I mean, these are, these are 
these are high, high, high quality guys that you can learn a lot from, and they're very entertaining to watch. Man, well said. And I think their coach this year is a uh, – what's his name? He's a, He was an old Barcelona coach. When Barcelona had that – oh, ironically, I think he was the coach when Barcelona beat PSG 6-1. to one. Oh, really? Uh, wow. Is it, is, it, is it Luis Enrique? Yeah, I think Luis Enrique yeah. was the coach of, of yeah. Barcelona. <laughs> they mm-hmm. did that. It's funny how soccer, they're just so fickle. They're like, whatever, you're a good coach. Come on over here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's go on to this next tie. We've got Inter versus Atletico Madrid. I'm going to let you go here because I think – Everyone could tell my answer already. I mean, that's that's going to be a good game, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's going to that's gonna be a really good game. I Oh, that's really tough. Something to point out here is that in the group stage, not only is Antoine Griezmann tied for leading mm-hmm. goal scorer, but so is Alvaro Morata, both with right. five goals. The two of them are leading. Yeah, I mean... So, I, I, in, I'm with you, you know, Inter, obviously, I mean, they're, they're in first very... place. They're flying. They're doing really well. Um, Atletico Madrid is just, I mean, they're they're built for this. They are built for a series of one-off games. Uh, they, they're they tactically the way that they set up. Uh, they're ultra competitive and, and, and built to to just win these games. So, I, I mean, this is this is definitely, for me, the toughest one to split. The rest of them, the rest of them are, you know, all of these games are more straightforward than that one. If I had to say, just because of the the way that Atletico Madrid is built, I would say that I I think I'd probably give them. You know, I don't know if there's an edge, but I, there's not an edge. I'll just go with Atletico Madrid. I don't think there's an edge between the two. I think they're very very evenly balanced. Yeah, I would I would absolutely agree with you on here on this one here uh both teams evenly matched another little caveat to add about inter is a that's another team that's struggling financially had they not sold brozovic and onana this past Mm. summer i think they would not have been able to register their team because they are so far Mm. in debt right now there's a chance that they actually go bankrupt this summer if they don't continue to spin players out if you look back they sold lukaku for 100 mil they sold hakimi for 80 mil, they sold Brozovic, then they sold Onana. They're mm-hmm. still bankrupt. That's almost yeah. 200 to $300 million, and they mm-hmm. still can't get their finances right. Shout out to their coach, whose last name is he's lost my, Inzaghi. Mm-hmm. Um, he, he got all the way to the Champions League finals last year with uh, kind of an underdog team. Didn't expect him to do that. And He's, he's back. I mean, he's back in the round of 16. So anything is possible with this Inter side. They just have a really good coach. They have a really good identity as far as the style of play. They love that three-man back line. They mm-hmm. did lose Skriniar to PSG, who was a very important player for that team. But if we look at Serie A, I believe they're in the top three. I think they're in second place, if I remember correctly. I think they're in first. First place. Son of a bitch. Yeah, so they're, I mean, they're still top dogs in their domestic league. Um, I'm just going to go with Inter because I love my Serie A teams, but would not be surprised if Diego Simeone brings his team into the round of eight here. He's always the X factor, man. He's got those guys ready to play. And, and again, I think, the, you know, the, the mental side of this not being a league game, there's just something about things being a one-off, the, the, the tension that exists – uh, in the atmosphere when when it, it comes to a knockout game is just it's 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 different again just not knowing for sure that you're going to be playing next week obviously you, you'll get the second leg but right uh, in, in the in the sense that you know hey if we don't take care of business we could be out uh, as compared to the league yeah you know you got you know you're always going to live to fight the the next game so to speak right. so yeah very true very well said it's a totally different mindset and Simeone loves these. I feel like he loves these mm-hmm. Champions League knockouts. Oof, can't wait to see it. We got four more matches here. Let's start with PSV versus Borussia Dortmund. This is a well matched <laughs> tie right here. Who do you got, Safe? That one is that 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 one is really difficult too. Uh, I'm gonna go with probably not my my brain kind of tells me Dortmund, uh, but I've just got a I've got a feeling that 
uh, PSV is gonna is gonna is gonna show up, and we're gonna see some some Dutch magic, uh, and and I've got a I've got a, a lovely uh, a lovely player on my team, Dutch guy, uh, Yip, and uh, you know hopefully he'll listen to this and be happy and proud <laughs> that I went with the uh, with with PSV, but I just uh, it's one of the, this is one of those gut feeling ones. I'm gonna go with the gut feeling on this one. You know, I've recently started to fall in love with the Eta Devis. Uh Watching Feyenoord take over the Eta Devis last season was like, wow, mm-hmm. it's finally not IX. <laughs> and to see right. so many of these players in the Dutch league starting to to migrate out and go to these other these other leagues. One of my favorites, I think he was on PSV. His name is Ibrahim Sangare. He's a uh, a center defensive mid from the Ivory Coast. I think he's on Nottingham Forest. I'm pretty mm-hmm. sure he was on PSV. It's either PSV or AZ. I'm pretty sure it's PSV. But they find these little gems. And not to mention our very own Ricardo Pepe is mm-hmm. on this PSV mm-hmm. team. I would love to see an American in further into the Champions League. Unfortunately, Christian Pulisic will not be there. You know, you've also got Weston McKinney on Juventus, didn't even get to the Champions League this year. So not of a lot of Americans. You know, you'd love to see Gio Reyna, but he's kind of lost favor with the coach at Dortmund. Uh, I think Dortmund definitely is the stronger side here. They uh, they really shocked me. I had Dortmund finishing in last place in Group F, and they totally made me look like a fool finishing in first place in my favorite team, finishing <laughs> in third. So – they uh they really they really stepped up this season. Going at the beginning of the season, they were pegged to be last in the group. They had a horrible right. start to the season. They lost Bellingham, they lost Holland, they didn't even replace him. Yet it doesn't matter. They finished in the first in the group. So could see Dortmund winning this, but I am also gonna go with you. I love me some Dutch teams. I love that style of play over in the Netherlands. So give me PSV and Ricardo Pepe to advance. This next one is going to be a little bit easier. Lazio versus Bayern Munich with the newly signed Harry Kane safe. Do we even need to talk about this one? <laughs> no, I mean, you know, as much as as much as I don't care to see Harry Kane scoring goals as an Arsenal fan, uh, the guy's unbelievable. He's an unbelievable player. Bayern's an absolute machine and and they're going to they're going to roll right through this one without a doubt. I think so. They uh, they look really good. They look much better than they did last year. Last year was probably the worst that they've been in the last 10 years. Almost losing the Bundesliga streak. I think they've now got 10 in a row. Uh, I think it was on the very last match day. Dortmund, all they had to do was win, and I think they drew. Uh, so Bayern got to keep that domestic league streak alive. They just look better, stronger. Uh, look for them to steamroll Lazio. I think Lazio might keep it competitive at home but as soon as they go to Bayern it's it's game over Bayern Munich Stadium is game over uh this next one is again Man City versus Copenhagen I mean yeah. hot take does Copenhagen even get a goal <laughs> maybe <laughs> I think this is just another one that's just a it's a big mismatch what are your thoughts yeah it's 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 Man City written all over without a doubt they'll they'll control the game uh they'll be They'll be really difficult to handle. They won't give the ball away. Uh, they'll be able to punish you in possession on the counter. I mean, you know, it's just it's 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 a tough draw for Copenhagen. Right. At least they get to bring Man City to their fans. Right. That'll be fun yeah. for them. <laughs> they get to see a top quality club in Copenhagen. That'll be fun for them. But that's right. Short short lived in the Champions League knockout stage. Uh, while we're here, I want to ask a quick question. The FIFA World, the Club World Cup just happened. Man City Fluminense from Brazil. Right. Did you happen to uh, get to check any highlights or watch that one at all? I didn't get to see it. So, very interestingly, Fluminense, they they played straight up with City, trying to dominate possession. Hmm. And I wanted to get your opinion on this. What is your play style or philosophy when you know that you are going to be placing a team that is superior to you before you even get there what is what what do you 
coach your players, your team to do heading into that game? Yeah, it's a, uh, you know, it's a little bit, it, things have changed a little bit uh, in the evolution of, you know, my 10 years coaching. Now I'm in a, I'm in a place where we're oftentimes that team uh, that people are having to adapt to play, you know, being kind of ranked where we are. And uh, so we'll get teams kind of adapting the way that they play against us. Um, and at Florida College, I think it was a lot, a lot more different where, you know, we were always the underdog uh, and we were adapting the way that we played. Uh, that said, we still do adapt the way that we play to some degree. Um, you know, we just will be ultra competitive regardless of, of how we do that. But I, I think that the what's really interesting about the question, and I've been in this situation before where I've gone to a national tournament. I remember going to a national tournament at Florida College in a national tournament semifinal. Uh, and we were playing a team that was, I mean, just head and shoulders, you know, pound for pound. They were just better. Uh, they were they were more athletic. They were better footballers. Um, and we, I had this debate with myself on, hey, do we, do we come out and do we try and play with these guys? Uh, or do we sit off, we try and absorb pressure, play on the counter, play for set pieces and see if we can make a result here. And uh, we, we played on the counter. We lost 2-0. Uh, both goals were not the prettiest goals for them. We kind of made a couple mistakes, uh, but you know, when, sometimes when you set off, you kind of invite that. So, you know, I, I think it's more about the matchup than it is maybe about, should we sit off and play, you know, because we're inferior? Uh, I think that that was maybe the way that I used to think about that was a bit more elementary. And I think now it's a bit more nuanced and, and more experienced and looking at it and saying, well, what's the matchup look like? Like if this team, and what I mean by that is, let's say this team is a very possession-based team and maybe the the back four aren't super athletic or the center backs aren't super athletic. You might consider then, you might consider sitting off even if you're good on the ball uh, because you might think, well, if we're really good on the counter and we've got really good pace coming the other way uh, and they're not very good in transition, we don't even need the ball. We're, we'll let them open their shape and just absolutely destroy them the other way. Uh, so that would be more of a case of what's the matchup look like. Uh, just like, you know, if we're a possession-based team, which we, we can play we can play a variety of styles. Uh, we prefer to play uh, as in possession. But if we're a possession-based team and we're playing against a team that, uh, that maybe their back line is not very big and they don't deal with service very well, you know, I can assure you that the ball's going out wide. We'll work the ball out wide and we're going to get crosses and we're going to get well-timed runs in the box and we're going to get people there for the knockdowns. Uh, so I think when it comes to, you know, when you're looking at elite levels, certainly at least for college and as certainly as it relates to me, I'm looking at the matchups uh, and I'm allowing the matchup to, to maybe guide the way that I'm going to go about the, the, the game in possession and out of possession uh, more so than I am like, are my players good enough? Are theirs too good or, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera, because I think that the margins are so slim, uh, but I think it's re it's 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 just one of those that I, I've heard the arguments back and forth, and they they all have some validity. You know, Flumen and Sam imagine is sitting there thinking, you know, this is if playing this way is what's got us here, we can't change now. You know, and 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 I re and I respect that too. And at the same time, uh, I am not a believer of you know, like Man City's going to play the, the way that they always play, but that's Man City. So that they can do that. Uh, I can't, I can't do that. So if I was Man City, then I can do that. So for me, I'm like, I'm going to look at the matchups and I'm going to, you know, adjust some things. Man City looks at the matchups and maybe starts uh, Phil Foden instead of Jack Grealish. That's a totally different, you know, ball game. And that's a, that's a huge luxury that the rest of us don't get to have. Right. Yeah. Well said. I'm, I'm going to try and find some clips. They, Fluminense was, was playing with fire. They, they were possessing it in their defensive third. And there was a lot of interchanging runs, passing forward to pass backwards, using the goalkeeper, going left and right, just pulling Man City as close to, the, to their net as possible. And then Marcelo or someone else would quickly send a ball through the air to the other side of the field, and now they're in the attacking third. And it was right. really impressive. I mean, it took a ton of balls. It required a ton of technical skill from every single one of those players, just the positioning. I got to send it to you. I mean, it's just mesmerizing how they just kind of knocked it around. 
and they're in front of their own net and you're like what the fuck like <laughs> good god it's so dangerous um and unfortunately the first goal that was scored was due to a one of the switches from Marcelo was not long enough and the man city player took it drove right at the net boom goal and you i mean it was in like the first minute and you're like oh man that's rough and then i think the second goal was an own goal i think um I think it, somebody took a shot and it deflected and it went in. The shot wasn't going to go in anyway, but because the player was there. Um, and again, it's just that playing with fire. But I was curious to see what your opinion is on that. Um, you know, do you change? Do you do you keep the way you are? It sounds like the answer, and I really like that response, is what is the matchup where we can exploit and have success and, and possibly get more attacking chances, which I think that's the smartest answer. Um, and I would, I would add that that is a luxury that you get. I don't ever get to see the matchups of a lot of the teams I play, you know, right. you kind of have to just remember like, Hey, we played this team last year. Like <laughs> you see them once, you know, you don't get to play them multiple right. times and there's no game film. So you don't get the watch mm-hmm. back. But, um, now that you say that I'm going to start to remember certain things about teams when we <laughs> play them, uh, cause we still have the playoffs to come up, but. But anyway, we've got one more match here. Leipzig versus Real Madrid. Again, another one that's just on paper. It doesn't look likely for uh, Leipzig to win this one. So Real Madrid also looking great with Ancelotti. Uh, Safe, what are your thoughts here? Uh, it's Yeah, Real, Real Madrid. I mean, oh. the, the, squad is, the squad is unbelievable. They always turn up for the Champions League. Uh, it's, you know, it's it's... It's not as straightforward as you know maybe one or one or two of these other ones, but it's pretty it's pretty straightforward on paper, and I think that the the quality and the squad and the experience is gonna is gonna carry that through. Yeah, one thing I would like to add is that they are they do have a bunch of players with torn ACLs. Real Madrid. Uh, I want to say that Courtois, Alaba, and Rudiger. I'd have to double check that, but I know that they have some significant injuries to their back line and the rumors are that they will be signing center backs in this January window to kind of shore up that that lack of depth on that back line there I'm hoping we can pull this up while this is loading that'll do it for our Champions League round of 16 predictions y'all should stick around because now we're going to get into some nitty gritty with Safe while he's here. Safe, he mentioned that you are the coach at Delta State. Did I say that? Is it Delta State? It's Dalton State. Dalton, sorry. Yeah, De- Dalton. Delta State in, is in uh, Mississippi, and Dalton State's in Northwest Georgia. Got it. Okay, Delta State, Dalton State. Um, right. Tell us your experience. So you've been there for this is going to be your sixth year coming up. I believe you are also the athletic director. I was my first year there, the interim athletic director. I got hired, and uh, the the athletic director got to move to a chief of staff position uh, with the president, and um, so he asked me to take over. And uh, after COVID, they ended up cutting that chief of staff position, so he kind of resumed back as the the athletic director. But that was a nice uh, nice experience to to continue to kind of uh, see the inner workings of the department. And uh, I had been an assistant athletic director for four years before that at Florida college. So it was good to, to kind of move chairs uh, one chair over and, and see what that's like and try and understand a little bit more of the inner workings of those things. Nice. Okay. So in that year, when you had to balance athletic director and head soccer coach and help me out here, are you both the, the men and the women Do you do both? I or? coach, I coach both at Dalton state. Wow. So were you doing, the men, the women, and you were the interim yes. athletic director all in the same year? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so, so break that down. How the fuck did you pull that off? <laughs> I mean, what? what? Was, did, I, were your soccer team successful? Did they? Was there like a drop in quality because you had to kind of distribute your focus in other places? Like just kind of share some experience you know, on that. I, I actually think the teams did pretty well. Um I remember the guys were receiving votes uh, 
nationally and made the national tournament for the first time in school history that uh, that year. Uh, and it was my first year there. So, I, I, you know, what I think was the hardest part was it being the first year because of all of the, the things that you try and implement. Uh, as you build the culture and build the program over time, you know, things start to certain things become self-sustaining uh, as long as you have the right leadership in place uh, in terms of not just, you know, the, the coach, but the coaching staff, uh, the, the captains in the team, uh, your leaders in the locker room you know, all of that stuff starts to sustain itself uh, to some degree. And now you're more oversight. Uh, but the first year you're, you're everything uh, because you're, you haven't established those things yet. So that was probably the hardest, the hardest uh, or the, the, the most difficult aspect of it was trying to establish just what I consider to be the basics of who we are and who we want to be. But those things are as much as they're basics now. And as much as, you know, the Dalton state way, if you like, is, uh, is cemented and there for anybody to see if they spend even you know five minutes around our players. Uh, at that time, it was not that was it was not commonplace for those things to exist. So that was the hard part was trying to get there, whilst my time being split uh, across you know several different things. So it was really it was really difficult. Uh, I think the you know a lot of prayer, <laughs> uh, and I have to say my wife you know. I mean, she's, you know, Sarah just was a, and, and always has been and still is just a, I mean, what a rock uh, to, to come home to and just have that stability in the home. And, you know, when, when your home is, when your home life is stable, man, you can, you can do anything. And, and I'll have to shout out my, my old mentor, uh, because I remember asking him, how am I going to do this when the opportunity came up and I asked him, should I do this? And I said, man, I just don't know if I can. And he said, safe, you can do anything for a year. <laughs> and I've always remembered that. Wow. And I'm like, you know what? I think he's right. I think yeah. you can do anything for a year. You know, yeah. I didn't think I could do that. And in the midst of it, I didn't think I was going to survive. And, and here I am. And, you know, I have that experience now. And yeah, he's right. Wow. That's awesome. Glad, glad you, you can could do say anything that. for a year, man. <laughs> so the, you said something that, that triggered a whole bunch of dialogue that I would love to get into with you, which is sure. culture. And this is often a something that is criticized with these professional teams, the culture, the identity. In your opinion, what is the best way to cultivate a culture that is already existing? And then to, to start it off, how do you create culture? How do you create identity? And then follow that up with how do you sustain that culture? Because you're shuffling players every four years. So how do you yeah, create and sustain this. culture? Yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> you know, changing, changing the hearts and minds of people is probably the most difficult thing that you'll ever undertake, uh, regardless of like what venue you're in, whether it's coaching or uh, you're, you're a manager at a Publix or, or whatever. It, it doesn't matter, uh, you know, even your own household. Uh, affecting the minds, of the, the hearts and minds of people is, is unbelievably challenging. So you know, it's a, it's a huge topic, but I'll try and be concise so that people can, you know, take some bits from it that I think they can try and start to apply. But I think that you have to be very clear in what you're looking for and you have to be able to articulate what those things are. So if you want to establish a culture, you need to have a really clear philosophy and vision for what you want things to look like. You need to have really well-defined and clear uh, core values that embody who you are and who you want it or what you want it to look like. And then you need to be able to know what the plan is from day one to, you know, day 500 and from day 500 back to day one. So, you know, it's a very, it's a very popular actually uh, interview question that people ask in interviews. Like they say, you know, Hey, if we hire you, what what's the first, I don't know, people have like different timelines, right? They say like, what's the first 30 days look like, or what are you going to do in your first 90 days or whatever? And when I think about culture and building a culture or building a team, I think about that. And I think about it. If you can't bring someone into your office and articulate to them what day one looks like and then what day 30 looks like and then what day 100 looks like and the differences between the three and work that from front to back, then if you can't do that, then you haven't thought deep enough uh, about how to establish your culture. So keep thinking until you can answer some of those questions and have that clear vision, have that ability to articulate that clear vision to somebody else. 
Uh, and then, then I think you're prepared. Two very different things to be able to do something and then teach, teach somebody uh, how to do something. So we all have, you know, our business models in our head. We all have like the way that we would, you know, the way that we would coach the team or the way that we would do this or whatever. And, and that's great. Maybe we do have that in our head, but to teach it to people and to influence them enough to agree that that's the right path to take and to join you, <laughs> that's a very different skill than it is to just come up with that thing. So I, you know, again, to answer the question briefly, it's just have that clear vision, have those clear core values, be able to articulate what they are and then what they look like over time. Man, that was awesome. We're going to, we're going to clip this right here and we're going to drop this on the social. So that was, that was well said. Okay. I've got a bunch of follow-ups, so I'm going to try not to just go for another 90 minutes here. No, no worries. I got time. <laughs> <laughs> well, then maybe we'll, we'll go for 90 minutes. There you go. <laughs> uh, what are your top three core values? Our, so we, we have, we have four uh, okay. in our Let's program. Go Let's go four. Yeah, we, we have four. Uh, to be uh, to to have integrity, to be workers, to be servants, uh, and to have competitive greatness. So integrity, wow. workers, servants, and competitive greatness. So when you come into our environment, which you'll you'll have to do, you'll have to come and spend uh, a couple days in preseason uh, in 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 August. That'd be awesome to have you have you in for that, a day man. or two. I can totally. Um, do that that that's the t that's that's the expected takeaway is that when you walk away and someone says well what was dalton state all about or you know what's the dalton state way the idea is that you would be able to articulate that to somebody and say you know what they're 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 good honest people they work really hard they care about each other uh, and man they're competitive you know that that would be the idea right love that man okay so now i've got a kind of a negative side of this hmm. what are some things that you have seen that can destroy a culture uh, inside of a team or inside of a locker room you know i think that th that's that's really kind of easy to identify i do think that people get this right i think that the other things we've, we've talked about people don't get as right as they maybe need to and as often uh, because they're very difficult but i think what a lot of people say about i mean you've heard the you know, one bad apple spoils the bunch type of thing. I think there's tons of truth in that stuff. When you don't have people that are committed to the cause uh, at the appropriate level, you know, it's, it's, I mean, imagine, you know, the, the sport crew is really interesting to me. And I look at those people in those little boats and, you know, I don't know how many there are, like four or five or something in the boat. And it probably varies. I'm not really sure. I'm not really educated on this, but the, but the principle I'm, I, I find interesting. I, imagine if one of those people, either stopped paddling or only paddled at like 70%, you know, cause who would stop paddling, right? It's like, right. well, that's a, that's a crazy example. Okay. Well, <laughs> what if someone gets a little bit tired and says, you know, what? I'm only going to paddle at 90% because I'm really sore and my arms are starting to get numb. I mean, you're going to lose pal. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, these things that they, they exist. If, if you don't have uh, people that are committed, uh, you're, you're going to struggle. And I think that that comes back to like the big, the big mistake that you can make on the front end. I would say it's recruiting your recruiting process. You need to vet people out really, really, really carefully and appropriately. And then while they're there. So once you've brought them in, because just cause you vetted someone out appropriately, doesn't mean it's going to work out. Um, while they're there, have it being able to be transparent and honest with people and creating clarity about what you're asking people to do, like what the expectations are, man. I mean, if, if I don't know what to expect, how, how can I, if, if I'm your player and, and you don't, you don't clearly communicate your expectations for me with the team and maybe in my individual position in possession and out of possession, well, how am I supposed to make you happy then? So th there's, you, you've got to be able to recruit right on the front end. And then you've got to be able to kind of goes back to what we talked about earlier uh, about having that clear vision. You've got to be able to articulate that clear vision, those expectations to those people so that they have a chance to, to then rise to the expectations that you have. Wow. These are gems. Another one. We'll clip that one out. 
Um, <laughs> okay. So <laughs> inside your team, uh, you know, being that you're the coach, you're on the sideline, there's only so much you can do from the sideline. Uh, one, how do you either select your, your captain, your leader, or how do you build one who maybe not <laughs> know that they are the, the leader of that team? That is such a good question. <laughs> All right. That is yeah. such a good question because I've asked that I've asked that to myself many times uh, over over ten years, and and I've had to do both. Right. So there have been some that that have uh, some some character some character traits that I think lend themselves really really nicely to becoming like a leader if they just spend enough time in the environment, and then there are some that maybe don't have don't have those character traits, but they have a really, let's say they have a really good heart and they have a really positive disposition. And I think that maybe I can develop those character traits in them, which is much more difficult. Uh, but I, I think that the way that you go about selecting it is by sticking to those core values that we talked about. So for me, it's trying to identify who, who in my team currently possesses these four core values and to what, to what extent do they possess them? So I'll give you an example like competitive greatness, competitive greatness. And I'll give you two examples. Competitive greatness is really the idea that in everything that we do, we're going to compete at the highest level. And I, I say this to recruits and they kind of laugh at me when I say it, but I'm like, even, you know, tying your shoe in the morning, like, you know, I'll say, you know, I want you to tie your shoe the best that you can. And they'll kind of laugh and I'll say, well, I don't know. Do you want it to come on done or not? <laughs> you know, like <laughs> you don't want to have to retie it later. Do you? Yeah, so it, yeah. it kind of makes more sense to him, but, uh, but, but this is the idea of competitive greatness is like finding those guys that uh, th they compete. They compete in the warm-up. They compete during the game. They compete during training. Uh, they compete in the classroom. They compete in the community. Like they're always wanting to be the best that they can be. Not that they're looking at other people and comparing, but they're just trying to be the best that they can be. So like who possesses those traits and to what degree do they possess them? Are they only interested in competing on the field? Or do they also, you know, hey, this guy's like, man – He's, you know, he or she, they're, they're getting after it in the classroom. They're getting after it on the pitch. They're getting after it uh, in, in the community and doing community events. Uh, another one would be like integrity. So like, so, you know, some, some of the, you know, the guys or girls, like what, what, to what extent do they believe in integrity? So for example, will they only tell the truth when it matters most uh, or when I'm speaking to them, or are they willing to maybe tell their teammate like a hard truth, even when I don't know about it? Like, are they, are they willing to be honest uh, in those venues, irrespective of whether I'm there or not? Uh, I think the way that people have put it, what, what do they say? Like, are you willing to uh, do what's right when no one's watching type thing? Um, so you'll, you'll see those, if you've recruited right, you'll see those characteristics in the majority of your team. So then it, it gets more difficult to, to discern between them. Uh, so that's when you're looking at, like, to what level do they execute those things? And that's kind of what you're you're trying to pick, you're trying to pick somebody that's going to emulate your core values the best that you can, because this is who you said that you're supposed to be and what you want your team to be. So then that's what that person needs to be able to, to do with themselves and then try and push and influence other people to do. Wow. Man. To be able to have that problem though, that's probably one of the best problems when you have so many players that exhibit those core values that it becomes difficult it's... to separate which one can lead the, the rest of those boys. You probably can't go wrong at that point. Cause if you if you can have that, yes. So remember, there's a difference because sometimes it's really difficult. There's a difference in possessing them, and this is where the, the hardest part about picking a captain is. There's a, a difference in possessing them and being able to influence other people to possess them and possess them at a higher level. So mm. it's I, I think that the majority of our players possess those things, but very few have the ability to influence people uh, others to do it and some some have it more than others and some like need a lot of some of them spend you know maybe three years being a captain because they're just amazing at it and then some spend three years of being a captain because they possess those characteristics so much but it's going to take me two years to get them to finally when they're a senior be able to influence other people to to do it so that's where you kind of get into like sometimes i've had up to three captains in one season uh all at the same time because maybe one is they all possess the, the 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 core values, but one is more vocal about it and able to influence people with their words. Maybe another one is like kind of like a do 
with their actions. They don't really say much, but they do with their actions. And then there might be one that possesses those qualities like to an, to an unbelievable level, but cannot influence people. So then they're kind of like the apprentice captain, if you like. Yeah, I see that. And they're, they're sitting there kind of learning with the, the, the first captain trying to see, okay, how, how is he influencing the others? How can I then begin to learn how to influence others? You got it. Interesting. I like that strategy. You got, you know, your underclassmen, upperclassmen kind of, it, it's almost inherent with that upperclassman to lead the younger classmen. And then in sure. turn, it teaches that younger classman, oh, look, look how he's influencing me. Maybe I can influence when I get to that position. Anyway, right. um, really well said. Love how you, you can articulate your thoughts. That's probably one of my favorite things about asking you these hard questions is that you take your time and you can articulate exactly what it is and you have an answer it's not just like a bunch of mumbo jumbo like you actually have thought about these things and like have a response that you've that, that is like who you are you know it's not like you're coming up with this on the spot it's <laughs> right it's yeah really it's it's um, it's really refreshing to hear this kind of stuff so now yeah, i think if you want to be successful you got to be intentional that's right i would agree i would agree so now i want to get into some fun stuff what formation is your favorite, and then what formation do you run with uh, your boys' team right now? Well, <laughs> so that that's a that's a really interesting question. Um, I mean, it's de- my what what we play is definitely my for- favorite formation, if you like. All right. Um, I, I don't I don't know. I think most people call it a three four three, but we we do so much. We do so much. Uh, I don't know if the word is, you know, manipulating of tactics <laughs> uh, to try and, you know, have different different looks that we show our opponent to always keep them on their toes. But basically, we play with something like a 3-4-3. Three, three. Uh-oh. Just going to close that. All right. Uh, what about the 3-4-3 three, three in the attack do you like? In the attack, I think I like the base of it. Uh, I like I like being able to have three center backs – uh, and being able to have the goalkeeper and the central center back kind of stand at opposite angles. So you're almost building out with, with four, um, but you're able to push those wing backs either higher up the field if you want uh, to you know, help you whenever you get into the, the next phase of the attack, either in the middle third uh, or into the final third. So I, I really like the idea of having three. And part of the reason why I like the idea of having three as well is because not a lot of people will play against a three. So, you know, when people are trying to think about how they want to set up, uh, I think it's much easier to set up against a a uh, a back four because that's what most people play against, you know? So they'll be used to to dealing with that. So then when they get to a back three, like they're like, man, I'm going to have to do some some serious thinking here to <laughs> uh, to kind of set this, uh, this back three up. Okay, so... I love what you said. I'm going to try and quickly. That's not what I want. Let's see. Um, you want your graphics? Yeah, I was going to make it's, a graphic. It, would, it wouldn't let me. Uh, would it let me uh, be the uh, share my screen? You think? Oh, yeah, I could totally do that. Here, let me well, ha- hang on a second. Before you do that, let me see if I can, if I even remember my login here. <laughs> oh, here we go. I found it. It's in planning. Do you do you use your digital learning center to make graphics? Oh, I was able to log in. I remember my login for my sports session planner. Uh, I, I I mean I definitely do for uh, the the licenses, but the uh, uh, what is it um, for for like when when I'm not doing an, a U.S. soccer assignment, uh, I'm just doing I I use sports session planner. Oh, sports. yeah yeah I use sports session planner. I don't think I've ever heard of that. Is this free or is this a, you have to pay for this? It's a paid one, but you know what? I don't, I don't even think it's that expensive. Um, I know U S soccer is like $15 a year. It's like, that's worth it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. U S U S soccer's tool, uh, is, is useful. Um, sports session planner is, is useful. I'm trying to see if I have a, uh, I'm sure I already have a, yeah, I'll tell you what, can I edit this?
Yeah, here we go. If you want, if you want to hand me the screen, I think you can. I might be able to do it myself here. Present if I yep. click present. Yep. Let's see, share screen. Share screen. Support session planner. Share. Did it do it? Yep. Give me a second. I gotta add it. There it is. Okay. There we go. So yeah. Cool. So this is kind of the. This is kind of the 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 structure. Uh, so it's, I mean, basically, you know, the three, you can see my cursor, I'm assuming. Yep. Yep. Okay. The three and then the four and then the three. And then obviously you can manipulate like this front three. Uh, if you want, you know, you can drop this into a three, five, two. So like your front three, th this is part of why I like it so much too, is because you can, you can just manipulate this in, in a bunch of different ways really quickly. Uh, and then the thing that I like about the, uh, the build out. Uh, is you know that you can you have this uh let's say that we want to play you know get this back three spaced out and then the keeper here so it's almost like building in a four you know wow. um, with with those four so I, I like the stability of that and then you know you can do what you want with these guys one they both can stay uh one can go up higher and you can play with one pivot this is where the matchups matter right so like if you're if you're playing against a team uh, that you you really like the matchup, um, then yeah, you can you know you can uh, oh I didn't don't like that. Uh, you can send maybe you can send this guy forward. Uh, the, these guys can drop into midfield. You can just play with one nine if you want to overrun in the midfield. And then if you know let's say they play like a four four two diamond, and they've got four people in the midfield, I mean you could really stretch them and do something like this. Or you pin them into a back four because they have to deal with your two wing backs, uh, and now you've got these guys in midfield that can operate a little bit more freely. So it, it just gives you a lot of flexibility. You get you get a lot of flexibility in the way that you want to play. Incredible. All right, now in the defensive third, mm -hmm. are you dropping back with five here? How, how do you when a team comes at you and they're in possession? How do you how are you setting up here? We play. We defend in a three-five-two a lot of the times, really? so we're usually defending in something like uh, in, so, in some type of shape like uh, like this. And so you don't do your wing backs ever drop into that back line with you? So the way they do, depending on where the ball is. So if okay. the ball is here, uh, this guy's usually putting some amount of pressure. These guys obviously will shift a little bit, and this guy will tuck in. Ah, uh, okay. So your mm -hmm. far opposite side is dropping into the back line in case that right. Near side gets beat. So right. basically, we're always in a four. Yeah. But we're like like freeing up a guy to go put some pressure on the right. ball. Right. That makes sense. You'd, you'd rather meet the pressure than invite it. Um, it depends. On, yeah, it depends on how we're playing. We like to press. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it works really well for us to be able to, to send these guys forward and be able to put some pressure on the ball and still have enough balance in the back to where, you know, we're not we're not back there with just two people. Uh, we we've, we've usually got even if this guy steps in to pick somebody up in midfield, we still got three, rather than you know maybe being exposed with with two. Yep. Right. Love it. I don't have the the cojones to do a three four three with my ten and eleven year olds right now. <laughs> I don't they, blame you. Yeah, they're not. It's it's tough. It's tough to get that that idea of the the shift going. Uh, mm -hmm. So we just we pack in with a four four one one and. And we just can we get tight, man? We're tight. Man, I have played I played uh at Florida College. I played four one four one and oh, right. yep. And uh to really good effect. Okay. So it was it was it was good for me. That we played four one four one. We sat a little bit deeper, probably around here. Um something like this. Mm, interesting. Yeah, and, and we had we had I mean serious pace out wide um on the flanks so this worked really well for us to invite people to come out and play and then try and hit them on the counter the other way yeah wow i'm going with the traditional it's like a four four two uh but instead of having the two left right we do top bottom and mm. the the idea is that center forward and the center attacking mid your job is to prevent them from switching it along the back line, force them to bring the ball up the field right? and uh, keep them. We want to try and keep them on one side of the field. Like mm -hmm. if we can do that 
and wait for a mistake. Then those two guys up front, hopefully we can get them the ball and they can just counter. Um, I'm in this really weird league right now where I'm the only team that has seventh graders and every Mm. other team has got eighth graders. So they put their fastest players on both ends of the formation Mm -hmm. and they control the space on both sides of the field. It doesn't Mm -hmm. matter how many through balls we play. We will never win one ever. (laughs) Right. So you have to like beat this into these kids heads. Stop playing through balls we have to be a possession-based team and they love those through balls so (laughs) it's just it's a struggle it's a totally different ball game and um i'll get there we we got some time this is our uh, winter break so we don't play during the christmas and new years and then we pick it back up but uh right but anyway yeah so love talking tactics with you i want to ask you a non-soccer question but i'm trying to think of one um like of stuff, stuff that we talked about. I mean, we, we met each other at a coaching course, so mm-hmm. a soccer coaching course. So all we talked about was soccer. There was the issue of religion, which I yeah. loved. I loved that topic with you. Um, and I'm trying to think of like a good question that I that we could end this with. <laughs> maybe maybe we'll just have to invite you back on here, and I'll have to start thinking of some questions. Oh yeah, we'll have to we'll have to do it. Yeah, we'll have to do it. We we'll have to make it a thing. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, Champions League, we've got two months, I think, until Champions League kicks back up, maybe a month and a half. Mm-hmm. So we'll have plenty of time. My co-host just texted me, and uh, he's like, "Yo, I see you're on the on live. Like, sorry I couldn't make it. I'm like, no, no worries, man. We'll get you on here." He's the one. He's got much better intros. I'll have to find you. So, uh, he's he loves his sexual innuendos. His last name being Booty, B O O T Y. He's uh-huh. just, he's the master. And I, I'm always giggling in the background. I can never control myself. <laughs> he starts going. <laughs> uh, but anyway, let's just close it out here. We're at we're approaching 80 minutes. Uh, so when we end the podcast, we always like to ask our guests to give us a shout out. It can be someone you love, someone you hate. It can be a team. <laughs> some people love to get their rocks off, man. They love to talk their shit about some people. So we give them that space, man. Uh, but, yeah, it can be someone you love, someone you hate, a team, uh, an organization. It's whatever you want. Oh, man, shout out to, you know, obviously, like like I said earlier, my wife. Uh, shout out to, my you know, my teams. Uh, we got two tremendous teams at Dalton State. Our men's and women's teams are fantastic. Uh, shout out to my coaching staff and shout out to you for having a great podcast and uh, doing doing a great job and just bringing the, the sport that we love to life. And I think this is a, a tremendous thing. So you're the man. I appreciate you, man. My shout out is going to be more of the superficial. I'm going to shout out to Zlatan Ibrahimovic <laughs> for rejoining AC Milan in a managerial position. Very excited that he's back in the locker room with the lads. Uh, and then also, more importantly, shout out to you, man. You were the one that made this possible. You asked me, hey, man, when can I get on the podcast? And I was like, <laughs> well, when are you free? Let's get on. <laughs> well, we've been talking about it for a yeah, few years. We just yeah, never got it done. <laughs> yeah. And it's it's. Uh, I'm glad we finally did it. Uh, we, uh, we're we going to have to do this much more. And I'm going to have to like sit out and, and write some questions out. Those were just kind of on the spot. It was like, while he's talking, let me just – get some questions going. So this was, uh, this is really good. Really a pleasure to have you. And thanks for joining on the footy fetish podcast show. Yeah, brother. No, I appreciate it. And uh, I'm going to, I'm going to go and, and sort out my webcam so that the next time we get on here, you can actually, you can actually see me and see when I'm, when I'm nodding my head to what you're saying. Cause I'm just over here nodding my head and <laughs> you can't even tell. <laughs> I appreciate you brother. I appreciate you. Well, anyway, this has been the footy fetish show where the fetish is real and the footy is soccer. Peace out, Boy Scout. Safe, if you could just hang on. I got to get the...